the basis since so nice to see you all again. And um, those <coughs> who are new to me, or rather you, I might be new to you as well, um, it's hopefully, you're going to record this. <laughs> <laughs> Talk's going to be really short. I'm going to be very careful on my words. Um, yeah. Um, so I've um, been asked to talk about obedience, um, and it's, um, I suppose, not a particularly popular topic really nowadays. Everything's about freedom and liberation, and I'm going to talk about authority and obedience. Um, but the, um, the freedom that comes with that, um, which is counterintuitive. But I thought I'd start at the beginning. Um, the prologue of the rule of St. Benedict. That's <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. If it was the other, it would be another matter. <laughs> Um, so, the, the rule of St. Benedict starts with um, these few sentences. Listen carefully, my son, to the Master's instructions, and attend to them with the ear of your heart. This is advice from a father who loves you. Welcome it and faithfully put it into practice. The labour of obedience will bring you back to him from whom you have drifted through the sloth of disobedience. This message of mine is for you, then, if you are ready to give up your own will, once and for all, and armed with the strong and noble weapons of obedience, to do battle for the true King, Christ the Lord. <coughs> the Father's instructions from one who loves us. Um, Obedience, authority, um, should always be seen in that framework. True authority, true obedience, true um, <coughs> fatherhood is, is, is sort of grounded in, in love, in a place of love, and <coughs> allows one to be obedient to it. An instruction given in love for the benefit of, and for our good um, is one that we can put our trust in and can be truly obedient to. But we have to work at it. It's not easy. The labour of obedience <clears throat> means that we actually have to put a bit of effort into it. Um, yes, we'll be lazy and yes, we'll be kind of, oh, I want to do something else and all the other things that kind of get in the way of us just going, okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, there's a bit of effort required to it. Um, and obedience is closely connected with something that St. Benedict's really hot on, which is giving up of one's self-will. To give up your own will once and for all. Um, the source of our arrogance, pride, vainglory, our self-centeredness. Um, we need to let that go and allow ourselves to be and I'm trespassing on someone else's talk in the next few weeks, humble and humility, um, sort of those kind of uh, virtues. <clears throat> and we need to let them take root in our heart to enable us to be obedient. <clears throat> but it all starts with listening, because if we're not listening, then we're not going to be able to hear the instructions and the directions and therefore we're not going to be able to respond to them. <clears throat> so we must prepare ourselves. Um, St. Benedict says, we must prepare our hearts and bodies for the battle of holy obedience. And what is not possible to us by nature, let us ask the Lord to supply by the help of his grace. The great news is we're not in this on our own, like anything. Um, we always have God and his strength to draw on, and that 
also um, holds true for ideas of obedience. So we ask God for help. St. Benedict, in setting up his rule, um, talks about it as a school for the Lord's service. We're going to be trained, so obedience uh, and being able to listen to the teacher um, go hand in hand. He, this lovely sort of, sort of passage in still in the prologue talking about in drawing up its regulations we hope to set down nothing harsh nothing burdensome <coughs> the good of all concerned however may prompt us to a little strictness in order to amend faults and to safeguard love do not be daunted immediately by fear and run away from the road that leads to salvation it is bound to be narrow at the outset but as we progress in this way of life and in faith, we shall run on the path of God's commandments, our hearts overflowing with the inexpressible delight of love. Never swerving from his instructions then, but faithfully observing his teachings in the monastery until death, we shall through patience share in the sufferings of Christ, that we may deserve also to share in his kingdom. Amen. So this idea that out of concern for others, out of that sort of giving up of one's self-will and self-centeredness, we have rules and regulations that we are obedient to because it's for the benefit of the whole community rather than just for my own benefit. So obedience as one of those means where we're able to actually live in society, live in community. We um, aren't all out for our own um, gratification. We're not out for our, our, our own sort of benefit. We're not fighting each other over the resources. We're obedient to the rules that bind us together and allow us to live um, in a loving relationships. And um, it's helpful to look at what St. Benedict thinks are less than helpful types of monks, uh, whether they're monks indeed at all, um, to sh show the importance he puts on obedience. Um, in the first chapter, he talks about the kinds of monks, and he says there are four. There are two good and two bad. The good ones are the wo those who live in a monastery where they serve under a rule and an abbot. So obedience to a rule of life and to a, a superior. The second kind are those who, having done that and had lots of practice, become hermits. Those who, depending on God alone, are able to sort of fight the good fight. But he does mention two less than impressive types of monks. Um, and what the first type, which are the Saravites, have wrong are they have no experience to guide them, no rule to try them as gold is tried in a furnace, and therefore they have a character as soft as lead. So obedience and the practice of obedience as a training tool um, to allow us to become used to not giving in to our own self-desires, because they pen themselves up in their own sheepfolds, not the Lord's, their law is what they like to do, and whatever strikes their fancy, and anything they believe in and choose, they call holy. Holy, Anything they dislike, they consider forbidden. So it's totally subjective, it's totally, oh, I like that, it must be good, it must be allowed, because I like it. Um, ooh, no, I don't like that, no, that's not allowed, okay. So, <clears throat> obedience as a corrective to that sort of sort of self-desires and um, sort of subjective, just whatever I like is good sort of idea. <clears throat> um, the other type, the gyrobags, um, and they're the ones who drift from region to region. Um, so I'll just give a rider to the, the talk on stability um, and the importance of stability. Um, I always have interesting conversations with um, Father Nick Crow, who's a Dominican, 
um, when he brings down his retreat groups to uh, Worth Abbey. Um, I usually slip in at some point that he's a gyrovag because um, he doesn't have a vow of stability. Um, we get on quite well, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> But as I said um, at the beginning, this ability to be obedient um, requires a certain trust in the person that you're being obedient to. And um, in, the rule, in the chapter about the abbot, um, St. Benedict is quite um, clear that the abbot must not teach anything or decree or command anything that would deviate from the Lord's instructions. The abbot holding, understood to hold the place of Christ in the community is not to order anything that would be in conflict with the, the, sort of the rule of love, the rule of God, the instructions of Christ, um, because that then allows the community to be obedient without fear, without <coughs> that tension of I'm being ordered to do something I know is wrong, and yet I'm called to be obedient, and that all whole conflict is avoided by only ordering those things that are in keeping with God's instructions. It's the sort of checks and balances. The person you're being obedient to needs to be a true point of authority, one that is in keeping and aligned with the teachings of Christ um, and having sort of doubt and all of that because what's being ordered isn't in keeping with how we should be living. It's quite interesting and I think relevant that um, it's very much at the beginning of um, St. Benedict's sort of chapters of his sort of the central sort of core, his spirituality. Um, he has basically three chapters that run together. Obedience, humility, well, obedience, restraint of speech and humility <coughs> in that order. And I think it's, um, so returning back to my first point, which is sort of the need to listen. So it goes, obedience is really important in chapter 5. And then in chapter 6 it says, you actually have to be self-restrained in speech, because you can't be talking all the time, you need to be listening. And then humility to enable one to be obedient, and sort of that idea of giving up of oneself will. So they're kind of all linked together and in that make up a whole. But I suppose that the rule talks about two impetuses to obedience. One of them, the holy service that we have professed. And the other one is the dread of hell. Um, so a, a positive and a, net, a sort of slightly more fearful sort of approach. And I think we, we kind of we want everything to be nice and rosy and, and loving and everything. But um, there needs to be, I think, because of human nature, a little bit of a shall we say threat, or or not quite a threat, but um, a exposition of the reality of the consequences. It's like, if you're not, then things can go bad, and be aware of that, and if you want to avoid that, be good. Um, it's a helpful spur, especially when we're sort of going, well, why do I have to be good? I want to just sort of do whatever I want. It's like, well, you can, but that's what's going to happen. Okay, I'm going to avoid that. I'll go this <laughs> So, um, I think... No, it's, it's a helpful thing to keep in mind, not obsess about it, but kind of say living a holy and good life is going to lead us to a good place and not is going to not lead us to a good place. Um, and that can be a spur to us 
um, to be obedient when we're feeling tired, <coughs> resentful, a bit rubbish, and going, I'm just going to rebel. Um, and then you kind of like, mm, short term gain, long term benefit, I'll take the long term benefit. Mm -hmm. um, so it keeps us on the straight and narrow. Um, and so, um, so a combination of that and the understanding that the abbot holds the place of Christ. Um, he talks about the obedience of the disciple of the monk to the abbot um, being as if they were being obedient to God. Um, only because, as I said before, he only orders and commands things that are in keeping with the God's will. So he says, the Lord says, uh, no, sorry. They carry out the superior's orders as promptly as if the command came from God himself. The Lord says of men like this, no sooner did he hear than he obeyed me. Again, he tells teachers, whoever listens to you, listens to me. Such people as these immediately put aside their own concerns, abandon their own will, and lay down whatever they have in hand, leaving it unfinished. With the ready step of obedience, they follow the voice of authority in their actions. Almost at the same moment then, as the master gives the instruction, the disciple quickly puts it into practice in the fear of God, and both actions together are swiftly completed as one. It is love that impels them to pursue everlasting life. Therefore, they are eager to take the narrow road of which the Lord says, narrow is the road that leads to life. It's not obedience for obedience sake, it's for a higher goal. It's to enable us to follow more closely the path that leads to life. But just doing the action isn't enough. We can be grumbling in our hearts and give the outward expression of being obedient. But um, St. Benedict's onto this as well, and he says that's not a good thing. Indeed, those who, um, where is it? Yes. This obedience, however, will be acceptable to God and agreeable to men only if compliance with what is commanded is not cringing or sluggish or half-hearted, but free from any grumbling and any reaction <coughs> of unwing, unwilling, unwillingness. The disciple's obedience must be given gladly, for God loves a cheerful giver. If a disciple obeys grudgingly and grumbles, not only aloud, but also in his heart, then even, even though he carries out the order, his action will not be accepted with favour by God, who sees that he is grumbling in his heart. It has to be freely given. It's not something that can be impelled or compelled. Um, there's a... There's, a, there's an obedience that is pleasing to God, and there's an obedience that is just... I wouldn't say it was true obedience even, it was just, you're going through the motions, you're kind of grumbling, you're, you're rebelling in your heart, you're not giving yourself over to that virtue, you're just uh, putting on a show. Um, and it's something that we can all fall into, because um, we're doing it, aren't we? So what's the problem as well? With that kind of attitude, what's the good in it? Um, so it's just one of those facets of obedience that we need to internalize it as well as just doing the actions that would seemingly be obedient. But as I said, from that, you follow on to this chapter on restraint of speech. Um, and... <coughs> So in a flood of words, you will not avoid sinning. Um, the tongue holds the key to life and death. Um, speaking and teaching are the masters and task. The disciple is to be silent and to listen. So, to be obedient, we need to be receptive. We need to be listening. We can't be always giving out our own opinion. 
We have to be willing to hear the other, um, whether that's God or whether that's a human source of authority. And to help us and encourage us and to enable us to be obedient. St. Benedict then goes on to talk about humility extensively um, uh, because that is what enables us to give up our self-will, to be truly obedient and willing to follow someone else's rule, the rule and the authority of the, of the superior. But again, that's someone else's talk, so I will leave that. Um, but I suppose I want to finish with the idea that <coughs> obedience is an essential part of Benedictine spirituality. And often the question comes about, um, can one be Benedictine out in the world? Um, and when that kind of question is asked, my answer is, well, possibly, but where's your obedience? Because obedience and the humility that comes with it and everything else is a central element of that. Um, the position of the abbot is a central part of Benedictine spirituality. The obedience, the humility, the giving up of one's self-will, having a rule and an abbot to follow. Um, and so my question is, what's the equivalent out in the world? Who do you go to to ask for permission for things? Whether that's in your day-to-day -day life, whether that's in your spiritual life. When you're considering an important decision, do you turn to a spiritual father, a spiritual guide, to see what they think? Do you ask what does the church teach on X, Y or Z and be receptive to that rather than just going, oh well that's the church, they don't know what they're talking about. Um, my life is sort of unique to myself and my circumstances mean that I can ignore that. Um, uh, all the excuses that we, we like to throw out there. Um, and I suppose that's, that's the challenge that I ask. If people want to be Benedictine and engage with that spirituality, how do they engage with obedience um, and the authority figure that you, we find in the rule? And on that note, as I'm aware that I'm meant to be talking for 20, 25 minutes or so, I will leave it at that. Yes. Cool. So, 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 so,